Okay, so I apologize for the roughness of this, but uh, this is all I have technically right now. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is this video, which I tentatively titled uh, World War II fighter aircraft designers did not understand what they designed. And the subtitle could be Propeller aircraft engineers do not understand the internal leverages of World War II single-engine fighter aircrafts. Now, the, the reason why I'm saying that is that the, the, the basic problem I think I have discovered with what they assumed they understood about these machines is they did not think these machines were subjected to a web of internal leverages. And it seems that internal leverages are very counterintuitive. And I have an example I want to show of a machine that has internal leverages that a professor of physics bet uh, $10,000 that what the claim was about this car was not possible. Uh, the car in question, essentially the same principles as with aircraft, but it, of course, completely different leverages. But this car here had wheels and a propeller on a shaft above itself. And when you started turning the wheel, the wheel were geared to the propeller above the car. It was the wheels driving the propeller. And so you gave the car a small push and then the propeller started to turn because the wheels turned. And because it had favorable leverages between the wheel and the propeller, the propeller started to pull the car. And of course the wheel would then turn more and would turn the propeller more and the propeller would turn the wheels more and the wheel would turn the propeller even more and the car constantly accelerated even though the initial push was maybe just a small gust of wind, but the car started to accelerate to the point that it would go, uh, it reached consistent speeds of about two and a half times the wind speed. And it was still accelerating when it ran out of room and the experiment had to stop. But basically the record was set at 2.8 times wind speed or whatever it was. And a professor of physics actually thought that this was not possible because it would mean, uh, if this was possible, it would mean the car could accelerate indefinitely. But the reason why he, um, he could not understand this is that internal leverages that are within an object are counterintuitive. And they they appear to violate the laws of physics, but they're nothing more than leverages. But he, even though he was a professor of physics, and he had several other professors of physics that agreed with him, or that at least had doubts, and that went into all kinds of complicated calculation, how this car could not actually go faster than the wind, uh, he was willing to bet $10,000, and he lost. I never would have made that bet because, and I will show you how simple uh, it is to lose $10,000 on such a, such a bet. Uh, here, here is the explanation for the car. I hope you can hear this. So it is the wheels driving the prop. Uh, it's not well explained that probably you need to give the car a push initially to set the process going. But uh, or a gust of wind has to start it. It's not really explained what starts the push of the wheel, like what, what is the, the triggering point. But once the triggering point is done, the wheels will turn, and because the propeller has such a great surface, it will actually continue to accelerate the car and thus accelerate itself through the turning of the wheels. And uh, so the professor of physics lost his bet even though it seems to violate the laws of physics, but it doesn't, of course. And I will show you how stupid the, the professor of physics was to make this assumption based on calculations. You can see that at 1320, if I'm not mistaken, you can see how, 
how really simple is his error. And this is a professor of physics, so you can assume that uh, a lot of engineers are, are, are going to make similar mistakes because these things are so counterintuitive. But I will show you how simple it is. Look how simple it is, how simple the solution to the problem is. This is exactly what this car is doing with its wheel and propeller. And look how counterintuitive it is. Makes the problem look more complicated than it actually is. You don't actually need aerodynamics. Here I have a little cart with a big wheel that rolls on two smaller spools. And what I'm going to show is that when you have two media moving relative to one another, well then, if this car is in contact with both media, it can actually move faster than their relative velocity. So as I push the board to the right, you can see that the car goes down the board faster than the board is moving. If you look carefully, you'll see that the big wheel isn't turning the way that the board is pushing it. It's actually rotating in the opposite direction. That's just like the propeller on Blackbird, which pushes back against the air, and that's how it's able to go faster than the wind downwind. Now, you can build one of these cars for yourself at home. So that's how simple it is and how counterintuitive internal leverages are. Uh, now, of course, my video is about World War II aircraft. So what are these counterintuitive leverages that I'm talking about uh, that, are, uh, that have made our understanding of specifically how these aircraft turned? It's mainly what I'm talking about is turning behavior. Uh, turning behavior brings out internal leverages very similar to this, but of course different in aspect that should be fine okay so so what are the internal leverages here uh i try to represent what is going on uh below is the normal position of the center of lift and the center of gravity the center of gravity is represented by the red line red arrow going down and the center of lift is represented by the blue arrow going up. Now, um, in, the, in the picture above is what I think is going on when the aircraft is on, is on an 80 or near 90 degree bank and is turning. So you have to imagine that the top aircraft is flying in curving air and is actually generating upward lift. Uh, in excess uh, to continuously turn and so what what I think is happening that is causing internal leverages is the air that normally would go under the wing uh, is kind of distorted especially in the this the air spiral that the propeller does it is distorted and it some of it leaks above the wing, creating more vacuum above the wing. And some, some of the rest of the bottom area of the propeller is also distorted by this. And this might create more lift, on, uh, more pressure on the bottom of the wing. As it is right now, they don't even know they have a problem. So I will present now these two quotes. So quote number one is... The Red Fleet uh, Technical Trends article, uh, number 37, February 1943. A technical summary of one year of front-wide encounters with the Fuckwell 490A. Now, this is just the one fundamental quote that really uh, clinches the deal. This is after observation of hundreds of combats over one entire year over the entire Eastern Front. This is what it boils down to. The Focke-Wulf 190A will inevitably offer turning combat at the minimum speed. So that's the first fundamental quote. 
The other fundamental quote is by a Finnish ace uh, 109 pilot uh, named Kiosti Karhila, 32 kill Finnish ace, discussing the Mi 109 G6, on which I think he did most of his kills. When the enemy reduced power, I reduced power even more. And the most important part of that interview. The optimal speed for turning combat on the Mi-109 G6 at low altitudes appeared to be around 250 km per hour, or 160 miles per hour. Now, to give some perspective on what this means, uh, the, the stall speed gear down, uh, I think for landing, the minimum speed for landing for the Mi-109 was around 100 miles, I think maybe 105. Maybe it flared at 95, but anyway, the combat speed for a turn, the optimal combat speed for a turning dogfight, he says, is barely 60 miles an hour above landing speed. Just that quote alone tells you uh, the physics of these aircraft is not understood. That quote alone it basically blows the whole edifice down. Uh, when I discuss this, I haven't really thought of concentrating on that one quote because there are so many other quotes that are confirm what I'm saying. Uh, basically, that confirmed the, the 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 theory that I that I presented, and the. The one time that I presented this quote, uh, the counter-argument was basically that the quote is wrong, uh, or that the pilot is mistaken, even though he's a 32 kill ace and all that. Uh, what most people I discuss with prefer to rely on, they prefer to rely on test pilots of the 1940s era. And what I have found is that test pilots were, are very often or nearly always wrong in their conclusions about aircraft. Uh, even though they test fly them, uh, in combat it was a different kettle of fish. It was completely different. And one of the differences you can see here is that in combat, uh, it, essentially combat boiled down to two things, high speed hit and run or low speed turn fighting. There was no high speed turn fighting because the speed was lost very rapidly. These aircraft could not maintain high speeds while turning. So immediately a high speed turn would turn into a low speed turn immediately. And so what happens here is that you have a quoted optimal speed for turning that cannot be at full power and that even cannot be at uh, maximum continuous power, that speed, that optimal combat speed for turning on a 1944 aircraft can only be at v v significantly reduced throttle. I would not guess how much, how much the throttle was reduced. But if the optimal speed is 160 miles an hour, that is not at full power. 